From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. The numbers are in. We asked 500 likely Democratic primary voters who they would choose for governor if the election were today. Our exclusive Eyewitness News Providence Journal poll shows 33% say they would vote for Mayor Angel Tavares, 29% Treasurer Gina Raimondo, 12% Clay Pell, and 2% Todd Giroux. 22% of the voters say they aren't sure who they would vote for in the Democratic primary. The four-point spread between Tavares and Raimondo is within the margin of error of 4.38%. But what does Clay Pell do to make his campaign competitive? Plus... Why am I supporting Ken Block? Well, take it from me. It's the smart choice. Don't be a blockhead. Say no to Ken Block. Shots fired in the Republican primary for governor. With three months to the September elections, our political roundtable handicaps the governor's race this week on Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me this week on the roundtable, to my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and Rhode Island, political, uh, Rhode Island Public Radio political reporter Ian Donis. And to my left, Eyewitness News political analyst and pollster extraordinaire Joe Fleming and Providence Journal columnist Ed Fitzpatrick. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on the program. It's good to have you. Good morning. Um, morning. I want to bring up, uh, I want to talk about Clay Pell first, and I want to bring up a graphic from our poll on, on Clay Pell. And this is his unfavorability numbers. The poll was not a kind one to, to Mr. Pell, and it shows in our February poll, that's the number on your left on the screen, 21% of primary voters had an unfavorable opinion of him. That number jumped to 32% unfavorable in this most recent survey. Joe Fleming, what's the story behind these numbers here? Well, the main thing is simply Clay Pell in February, 41% of the voters didn't even know who he was. That's now down to 33%. So he's not that well known. But what's happened is, over the la these last few months, what's the one thing people talked about Clay Pell? The, pr the car. His car was stolen. They couldn't find his car. That's the one thing they saw with Clay Pell. He's had a lot of press conferences, but the one thing that resonates with the voters is the stolen car. And I think as a result of that, his negative numbers have gone up. Ian, what could he have done about that? Well, the thing you really have to wonder about, Tim, is how it would be different if Pell had gone up on television with a biographical spot highlighting his own profile, his family, his well-known grandfather, Claiborne Pell, a beloved figure in Rhode Island. And instead, he's rolled out some policy stuff, but a lot of voters don't really pay attention to that. And as a result, as Joe said, Pell has been defined by this car issue. Is there a path, Ed? to victory for Clay Pell right now? Well, it's probably a path, but it's, it's uphill. You know, I, I think he's, he's put $2 million of his own money into the race. It's time to spend it. What do you think, Ted? You know, I think, uh, I, think I've, I agree with pretty much everything everyone's saying. I think for Clay Pell, to the extent he can make this competitive, and his campaign is adamant he's not dropping out. He's in this for the long haul. You know, we do know he's loaned his campaign $2 million, so he hasn't spent most of it yet. I think, you know, our debate is coming up on Tuesday night. It'll be the first time, uh, you and Ed and I will be up there hammering them, and it'll be the first time Clay Pell is seen by a wide audience. And then I think they've got to get up on TV and start to change his image, or even yeah, wasn't give that a, him Wasn't an that image. a mistake, I mean, to, to not have an image spot ready to go uh, when something like this happened, or even before it happened. Well, and even if, if not an image spot, then I think having a better response to the, the car thing. It, the car thing was whether, of course, What it's was not, their response? Remind everyone. It, there wasn't much right. of one. They, they, they were pretty dismissive of it. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I have some sympathy for the fact that it was kind of a silly story, but it had legs. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, politicians, good politicians know you have to deal with the stories the media is covering, even if you don't like I, that they're covering them. I so. am totally surprised they have not gone up. You would think with the highest number of voters who don't know who you are, and you had two other opponents who are better known, you're going to go up first. Forget the car thing. You want to get up there first to start building an image of yourself. If people don't know you, that allows you to build a positive image of you. But what's happened, Gene has gone up, Angel's gone up, and Clay Pell is still not on the air, and he's the weakest known of all the candidates. And let's does that make sense? Let's remember that the two front-running Democrats, Angel Tavares and Gina Raimondo, benefit from having been in public office for almost four years, and they're seen as by their supporters as problem solvers on different issues. Mm -hmm. Pell has doesn't have that kind of profile in Rhode Island from serving in a state. Uh, uh, 
an office here. I just add, they're also popular. I mean, Angel yes. Tavares' favorable rating among Democratic primary voters in our poll, I believe, was about, uh, where is it here? 67%, very high. And Gina Raimondo, not as high as him, but 54%, right. respectable number. Clay Pell down at 35 with a lot of unknowns. So, you know, he's, it's not like he's running against damaged candidates no. either. He really needs to, to talk to So people. let's touch on the rumor that you just mentioned briefly. And there is a lot of talk in the inner circle asking the question as to whether or not Clay Pell is going to, to drop out. You indicated you think he's going to stay in at this point. I, based on everything I've heard from his campaign, they say he's in, he's in, he's in. Anybody else hearing anything different? I'm hearing that? they're getting troops on the ground right now. They're getting the media ready to go. I have to assume what Clay Pell's hoping to do is that Gina and Angel go after each other so much that he comes down the middle as the alternative candidate. That's a very risky strategy, especially when you're so far behind to stop. Yeah, he, he's a newcomer, so I think it took a while for them to get the campaign up and running, but I, I expect him to start Spring spending support. that money now. All right, yeah. I want to go ahead. Ian. Yeah, and I expect Pell to stay in it for the long haul. He has more to uh, gain by staying in it than getting out at this point. Well, but as Ted just pointed out, I mean, what he has to lose is his own money. He hasn't, that, that I know of, we haven't seen this quarter uh, filings. He hasn't dipped into his own $2 million yet, as you said. I mean, this, that, right, I mean, this uh, is the moment I, of truth for him, I, and he's not exactly fundraising if, off this poll, If is he's he? going to have a future in politics, if he doesn't win this year, he needs to have a respectable showing, and he's conceivably got some room to grow rather than backsliding, as he did in the most recent poll. I think, I think just briefly, Joe's right. They're, they're, they, the Pell campaign thinks this can be won on the ground with ground troops in a three-way race, field field operations. They know that worked for Lincoln Chafee. And he has a savvy uh, per, Bob he Walsh Bob from Walsh NEA. NEA to help with that. And then they have Tad Devine, a well-known Democratic strategist, right. doing their ads, and they think those can make a difference. Yeah, and I, I think their only hope is that they see that 22% of the people are undecided still, and they can go after that, and you see where uh, some of the Tavares' supporters not as strong as Raimondo's. Maybe they can attack that. All right, let's, let's talk about strength of support now, and I want to bring up another graphic here from our poll. We asked about strength of support. Joe, give us the top-line numbers on the, these. The top-line numbers, Tim, is I'm very surprised. 41% of the voters said there's a pretty good chance that they could change their mind on who they are supporting today. Another 38% said they're definitely going to support the candidate they're saying they're supporting. And another 16% said they're pretty unlikely to change their mind. So, Ted, I think the interesting number when you uh, break this down is uh, the strength of support for individual candidates. In other words, if uh, the person on the poll, when they were asked, who do you choose in the head-to-head -head race if they choose uh, Gina Raimondo? Well, w are you going to stay with them or you're not going to stay with them? And what did that show? Yeah, you actually, we had, uh, I, this is the first time we've done this question, and yep. it was interesting to see the definitely vote. So this is the share of people who said they chose Gina Raimondo, Clay Pell, or Angel Tavares, who said, definitely I'm not changing my mind. Gina Raimondo, 45% of her voters definitely staying with her. Clay Pell, 38%. Angel Tavares, only 33%. So you have the Pell. leader mm -hmm. in the race actually having the smallest share of people who are going to to, uh, who say they'll definitely stick with him and the highest share who say there's a good chance they'll change their mind. The risk for him there, of course, is that a, he's not converting his very high favorabilities into really high, strong support. And then Gina Raimondo has the money to really exploit any weakness there among the people who, who sort of like him but are about to see, we assume, a blizzard of negative ads. Why, Ian, are uh, Mayor Tavares's strength of support numbers softer than Gina Raimondo's, do you well, think? Well, I'll start it with Raimondo. I think she's a polarizing figure. People who like her really right. like her. People who dislike her because the pension overhaul in 2011 really don't like her. So I think it's not particularly surprising that her support is firmer. Tavares had, there, uh, there was good news for each of these leading Democrats in this most recent poll. I think there's room to grow for Raimondo at the same time. Tavares has to be happy that his public approval is so good. He's well liked. He's generally been the best approved politician in Rhode Island for the last four years. So, uh, you know, he faces a challenge in making that support more firm. Ed, do you have a thought? Well, I, I just think if people were thinking of changing their mind from Tavares to somebody else, it would be Pell. They, they wouldn't go to Raimondo. But, I mean, so, you know, Tavares has more support among the Democrats. You know, Raimondo's strong with the independents. So, I, I mean, that's, that's a strength for him. But Raimondo is also strong, which I find interesting, with voters 60 and older. And right. this is one of the interesting they things. They vote. And they vote. So yes. I, I agree with that. Angel Tavares' stronger support with Democrats among who people are voting for is important because it's a Democratic primary. But Gina Raimondo's stronger support with older voters, they go out to vote, too, in a Democratic right. primary. So, but, but the favorability, they still like Angel with high numbers, the seniors, but they're voting for Gina at this time. So he has a way to move those voters possibly. I have a, I had a question about that. While Tavares really has very, very good favorability right. numbers, 
people like them. Why don't those favorability numbers automatically translate into votes? Well, they are in the sense that he's winning the race right now. Within the margin of within error. Within the margin of error. And nowhere near his favorability. No, and what it is, his favorability is extremely high among voters who say they are Democrats. 70% give him a favorable rating, where Gina has a 51%. Among independent voters, they're about even, and Gina gets the benefit of their votes. Uh, the question is, some of the Democrats maybe are not totally convinced that he's the person at this time, that they're keeping an open mind, that they haven't made the final decision. That's why his support's a little weak. I think what they got to do over the next month or two is try to solidify his support and show that he is the strong candidate who can get the job done as governor. Uh, you, this time, the poll uh, split here um, when you talk about Democrats favor right. and in, uh, Tavares, Independents favor Ramondo. What is the split? It's roughly about 60 40. Okay. 60 percent Democrat. 60 percent Democrat, 40 percent Independents. Anyone here surprised that uh, Treasurer Gina Ramondo and the favorability number only? There was 20% of the Democratic primary voters now. We're not talking all of Rhode Island. This is Democratic primary voters just didn't know who she was. Does that seem high to anyone? Not really. We were, uh, Joe has said to us before that Frank Caprio in 2010 was up at about 30% uh, unknowns at this time. So we've got to remember, as much as the people sitting at this table, and I assume the viewers who are watching Newsmakers, thank you for watching, they, um, they pay a lot of attention to this stuff. Politics is big. Most people, aren't, they care about cookouts. They care about other things. They're not interested. Hey, one, go ahead. I was say one other thing. Among the voters who are not sure who they're voting for, 41% of them could not answer the question if they had a favorable or unfavorable opinion of Gina Raimondo. Mm. So almost half of the not sure voters don't even know have an opinion of her at this time, which in some ways is good for her. I was going to say, because she, she can now build the positive image, which she's trying to do with the ads that she's running. So the ads right now are all the positive image ads. Right. On, we'll get to the Republican primary in the second half, but in the Democratic primary, it's Gina Raimondo riding a bike with her family. Um, but talking about the economy, and you see that in the, the numbers Joe was just talking about, I think it was 46%, almost half of the undecided voters, economy and jobs are their most important issue. Not a surprise, but again, that's the ground where this is probably going to be fought for a lot of those people. Yeah. One thing I've been struck by Raimondo's two ads, they're very different in tone. One is an homage to her, her father who passed away recently. The other is a happy, upbeat family bicycle ride. The emphasis is on her family, and I think that's very deliberate. She's trying to depict herself as an ordinary Rhode Islander. She's a very high achiever, former venture capitalist. She's a pretty elite person, and I think she's trying to reach out to the independent voters who she really needs. Independent mm -hmm. voters, how about women? Is she reaching out to women, and particularly with the family ad, and, and we saw improvement in her numbers there. Well, again, most of this poll was done before the ads hit the air or the airways. They just started on Wednesday. We went in the field on the Tuesday. But the last poll, she was down by 6% among female voters. This time, she's down by 2%. Mm -hmm. So I think all the work she's been doing the last few months to soften up her image is starting to pay off for her. When did we go ahead, Ed? Uh, I don't know how much longer the, the good feelings will last, that's, though. You that's know? Right. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> the bike rides. And, uh, you know, I, I think you'll start to see them trying to distinguish themselves, maybe attack. I mean, I think you'll hear Tavares talking about, uh, you know, I'm for Main Street, she's for Wall Street. I think you'll mm -hmm. hear her, uh, Ramondo start talking about the problems in Providence. She, she started talking about problems in her kid's school the other day at the... They uh, already talk about those things, and we, you know, their campaigns lob those volleys that we get them in the, in the press all the time there's a big difference when you go up on paid media right. with something like that and we're going into the doldrums of summer do we anticipate the Democrat, uh, Democratic primary to go negative with paid media, you know, anytime before the end of August? You know, they're running out of time, right? I mean, right. It's, it's about three months from this weekend mm -hmm. where we're taping this show uh, before the primary. I went to a forum a couple weeks ago uh, where the, the Democratic candidates and the Republican ones, well, the Republicans are going at it already, you know, as we're going to talk about. The Democrats, super polite, you know, really out took, I would say, almost no shots at each other among the three major candidates. And, and that's fine, and it's, it's probably some voters say, that's kind of nice, but you know that's not to say how you win a race when you need to draw distinctions and contrast and show people why you should vote for me and why you shouldn't vote for him. And uh, there is an art to uh, doing negative yes. uh, campaigning, and we're, we're certainly going to talk about the Republican primary, and that's already gone negative. We're going to wrap up the first half here uh, with this question. Uh, three months to go, is this Angel Tavares' to lose, Ian Donis? I think it's a very close race. I think it's, uh, you know, this race was in within the margin of error in, in Joe's poll. And I would not, I'd say it's really up for grabs. That's been a constant based on the polling information for the last sequence of polls. 
both Tavares and Ramundo have different advantages and weaknesses. So I would not say it's Tavares's to lose, nor would I say it's Ramundo's to lose. I'd say it's it's head to head, neck to neck. Primarily a two way race, gentlemen. Would you say at this point? It, at this point, it's a two way race. But again, Clay Pell strategy, I think, is what we're talking about. That if Gina and Angel basically go after each other negative, he could possibly be the benefit of that. Negative will bring the opponent down. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get that vote. Clay Pell could position himself to pick up some of those votes and become a factor in the race. Just briefly, I actually, I think I do think it's Tavares' is to lose. I just can see in this poll how he would lose, right? If the support stays soft and Gina Raimondo uses her much more significant resources to really pummel him and bring down those positives, then you can see how he would end up not coming out on top. But he is, he's in a good position. We shouldn't overlook that here. It's just he is financially at a disadvantage to the other two. Yeah, he has two and a half times the money. So, I, you know, I think if Pell wasn't in the race, it would be Tavares' to lose. But right now, I think it's a jump ball. And the crown game is going to be hugely significant. The get out the vote effort. Romano right. needs more independence. Tavares needs more Democrats. That's going to be very important. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Republican primary and that ad everyone's talking about, the blockhead ad. We're going to dissect that one. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This week on Newsmakers, a political roundtable with a focus on the gubernatorial race for 2014. I'm joined to my right with uh, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and from Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. To my left, Joe Fleming, our eyewitness news political analyst, and Ed Fitzpatrick from the Providence Journal. Okay, so we want to uh, talk about the GOP primary. We've been the first half was dominated by the Democratic primary for governor. Cranston Mayor Alan Fung has taken his first shot in the race with a biting ad aimed at his Republican challenger, Ken Block. It's dubbed Blockhead. If you haven't seen it, here's just a taste of it. Why am I supporting Ken Block for governor? Well, I just love that he voted for President Obama twice. Block supports Obamacare. He won't pass the buck. He'll spend it. Block supports billions. All right, that is Alan Fung's ad obviously against uh, Ken Block. Uh, let me ask the table here. First, do you think the ad is effective? I think so. I mean, I think using humor in an attack is an effective tactic. It's kind of disarming. It has a cutting message, but using this kind of humorous blockhead motif is a way of softening it and making it seem less mean. And at the same time, it shows that the Fung campaign is concerned about Block. Yeah, I was going to say, think about this. Ken Block was a moderate. He's now a Republican. How far has he come that the mayor of Cranston, a very well-known Republican, is attacking a person who just became a Republican? Ken Block obviously has gotten a lot of traction in the Republican Party already. And Alan Fung cannot allow that to continue. So and that's what he's trying to stop. Ian just said um, that this shows that Alan Fung is concerned about Ken Block. And lest we forget, this is his second spot now. He did an right. image spot. Why, Ted, does it show that Alan Fung is worried? Well, I mean, I, it just it just appears that Alan Fung's campaign did not have an accurate theory of how Ken Block was going to play with Republican voters. I mean, I, I, I have some sympathy for them that, you know, knowing how Republicans feel about Barack Obama these days, the idea that someone who has admitted he voted for him twice would be a problem. But Ken Block is running a, a very disciplined, newsy, campaign that, that takes a lot of shots at the assembly, a classic outsider kind of race that Republicans in Rhode Island, I think, who are usually on the outside, really feel. And he's actually, it looks like Alan Fung also did not lock down support inside the party. We just saw this week that four of the six members of the uh, Senate Republican caucus in Rhode Island, which includes Ed O'Neill and Independent, who caucuses with them, are back in Ken Block. So, you know, it's, uh, it's really become a problem for Alan Fung. And I don't think they'd be taking this and spending this much money when he has limited resources if they didn't think they need Needed to, to, to do some or damage. if it will generate more fundraising, uh, that can also be the side effect here. Ed, um, sometimes negative ads can can backfire. Is this one of them? Well, I think one potential downside might be more long range. Is if you call the people supporting Ken Block blockheads, you know, are, are they going to appreciate that uh, <laughs> if Fung does it? Calling emerge? their bubbly, uh, baby ugly, essentially. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know. Keep, keep in mind one thing, though, with Republican primaries. We're talking about a trend up this year of maybe 25,000 to 45,000 Republican voters. It's a very small group. There's not a lot of voters to move. So I think Alan Fung realizes maybe his polling data is showing that people, the Republican voters, do not know that Ken Block voted for Barack Obama, and he has to get that message out there with TV and direct mail, more importantly, in a Republican primary. And let's remember the last time Rodan elected a Republican governor with Don Carcheri, he beat a 
previous Republican office holder, Jim Bennett, who had been a state treasurer, was much better known at the outset. Republican uh, voters have shown a preference for outsider candidates in gubernatorial primaries. Also, it's interesting because a lot when you talk to the Democrats about Alan Fung, when they used to presume that he'd be the Republican nominee, they said, boy, he can come in September 10th after we have maybe a vicious primary and say, I'm the positive guy, I haven't been doing attacks. Well, this has totally changed that because he was the first candidate now to do an attack ad. Yeah. And this is a big advantage for the Democrats, believe it or not. In past years, when we elect a Republican, Republican governors, they have civilized Republican primaries, not negative Republican primaries. The Democrats are killing each other. So after the primary, you have a lot of people upset with the Democrats. Well, now the Republicans are doing the same thing. They're not going to get the benefit of that this year yeah, because yeah. they're going to be so negative the whole from now to September. Well, right. only, only, only one half is negative right now, but Block is not a shy guy. No. So uh, we assume he's going to start going negative at this point. How, how does he attack Alan Fung? We've heard it. I think he attacks Alan Fung for being part of the establishment, for being someone who's holding office. I mean, even just if you hold office, you, you have to raise taxes. You have to take unpopular decisions. Ken Block has never had to do anything in public office that's bad. And, he, you know, he's criticizing You did a story, Tim, about uh, lobbying Fung work. lobbying for MetLife, his former job, against a flood insurance uh, disclosure bill. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do. But I, I think, again, Ken Block, it's as, it's as much a positive focus for him, well, a focus on attacking not Ken Block, but the Democrats. Democrats who run the General Assembly, and that's getting a lot of traction. Yeah. I agree with what Ted said. You could almost see Block's campaign turning Blockhead into a badge of honor, saying Blockheads are, are about saving Rhode Island and making it more economically viable. Yeah, I, I was thinking four years ago, you know, Victor Moffat was talking about the uh, world class aquarium. aquarium. It's a little, little different tone in, in this Republican <laughs> primary. And uh, yeah, I think you'll you'll start to see Block talk about problems in Cranston, just like they're going to talk about problems mm. in Providence. All right, I want to uh, shift gears to the general treasurer's race. Um, and this is a big primary because right now, there are no Republican announced Republican challengers. There are no independents. So at this time, whoever wins the general treasurer's race in the primary will be our next uh, treasurer. So we pulled on that. I want to bring up that graphic. This is between Frank Caprio, former Auditor General Ernest Del Monte, and Democrat Seth Magaziner. Caprio leads the pack with 29 percent. Seth Magaziner, 11 percent. Del Monte, 9 percent. A whopping 46 percent aren't sure who they will vote for. Um, immediately after the poll came out, both Caprio and Magaziner called it good news. <laughs> <laughs> so who's right? Who's right well, on this one? Well, for one thing, Almonte well, didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, Ian. the number that really jumps out, of course, is the huge number of undecideds. Right. And something that's interesting about Seth Magaziner is he's a first-time candidate, but he doesn't really acro come across like a first-time candidate. He's very poised. He's got politics in his DNA. His father, Ira Magaziner, worked in the Clinton White House and was very close to the Clintons. Bill Clinton's already done a New York City fundraiser for Seth Magaziner. So he has room to grow. And uh, Caprio is also he did He did really well on the show. I, I remember that when we had him on as a guest. We weren't, Ted and I never really interviewed him before. And uh, he was he was quick on his feet, but still 29 percent. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at here for, for Frank Caprio. I, I think it might have something to do with name recognition. You know, people know Caprio from the governor's race. Um, but that, that's a huge percentage uh, unsure. I think, you know, Magazine or Almonte both have to get up on TV as soon as they can. To How get are better you going to do that? Well, that no, seriously, I mean, it, the governor's race is sucking the oxygen out of the room. It's expensive. We're going into the summer. It, Tim, it's sucking the oxygen out. It could get worse. It could get worse in the sense of Buddy Cianci decides to run for mayor of Providence. <laughs> right. The media is going to be focusing more on Providence. And no one's going to look at lieutenant governor, secretary of state, or general treasurer. But you need to do a media buy now to get some name recognition. I mean, you're behind Frank Caprio by almost 20 points. If you let Frank Caprio get up there first and start rebuilding his image of what he did as general treasurer, it's going to be very difficult to catch him. I just had this, you know, so that's 29% for Caprio, so 70% of Democratic prime voters aren't yet sure whether to support their last nominee for governor and previous general treasurer for Shove general Monday. And, and that's the question. How many of those 70% are people who are actively not choosing Frank Caprio, knowing who he is and not being happy with him? But, and how many of them are just forgotten about him, as Joe says? But in the, in the governor's race in 2010, when we did our polling, Lincoln Chapey was winning the Democratic vote, not Frank Caprio. So he was the independent getting more Democratic votes than Frank Caprio. Uh, we're running close to time, and I just want to remind our viewers that we are just away from our first big live televised debate, Eyewitness News. And uh, first, actually, we're, we're more than a week away from the Republican gubernatorial <laughs> debate. Uh, that is June 17th. I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, Ted and I will be there, and I presume Ed Fitzpatrick from the Providence Journal. Yes. Um, 
This could be good between Alan Fung and Ken Block. We've already seen some uh, fisticuffs going in that one, so that could be a uh, debate. A week prior to that, we have the Democratic primary debate, and that is a three-way debate between Clay Pell, Angel Tavares, and Gina Raimondo. Hope you can join us for that one. 7 o'clock right here on Channel 12. We're broadcasting live from Providence Performing Arts Center. We have less than a minute left. You touched on the Providence mayoral race. Um, if... Uh, Buddy Cianci, if he jumps in and he has to do it in, you know, by the end of June, does he run as a Democrat and why? I believe he runs as a Democrat due to the fact that it's a more crowded field. Buddy Cianci has a ceiling of how many votes that he can get. The more candidates in the race, the better it is for him. Do the other Democrats get together, the uh, Lauren Adrians? Uh, of the world and Jorge Alorza's, do they, they get together and say, look, we have to tackle this because, you know. Uh, I'm not sure they have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the question then would be who gets, you know, how does that permutate? Who becomes an independent? Who gets out? It would be tough to make an agreement on that, but you can't rule out the Also puts Angel Tavares in a tough spot. What do you say about, you know, he and CNC have an okay relationship, but what are you going to say about that guy trying to take the job you're giving up? All right, we've got to go. Belated happy birthday to this guy, Ted Nisi. <laughs> turned the big 3 0. Oh. Thank you for watching. For Ted Nisi, Ian Donis. Ed Fitzpatrick and Joe Fleming. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.